yourself as a gentleman or a lady because no one put their hand up yesterday. So welcome to each and every one of you. Um, I do have some news and that is tomorrow um, I will bring around uh, the author Thomas Mollett and he will give you each a copy of one of his books. And if you want it signed, he can do that as well. Okay. But for today, it's drugs, drugs, and drugs. Drugs of use, drugs of abuse, and drugs of overuse. Okay, um, what I wanted to do is introduce you today to uh, Bronwyn Davies here in front. Bronwyn is, is the chief forensic toxicologist and the deputy director of the forensic toxicology with the Western Cape Government Department of Health. Forensic Pathology Services. It's quite a mouthful, but she's the, she's the chief honcho toxicologist at Salt River and Western Cape uh, Forensic Pathology Services. She manages the Forensic Toxicology Unit, which is in my division, the Foren Division of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology at UCT, Faculty of, of Health Sciences. She also works as a lecturer and is a supervisor of many of our postgraduate students. She previously studied in the United States of America and she received training at the Washington DC Medical Examiner's Office. Her research interest includes post-mortem well, <laughs> post toxicology, human performance toxicology, and that includes, for example, driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol and drug facilitated crime. And she's also an interest of, for her is also forensic science leadership and management. So you're actually looking at the only qualified forensic toxicologist in the country, practicing in the country at the moment. And I'm very glad that Bronwyn saw a way through of returning to South Africa after her, after her training in America. So I'm going to hand you over to Bronwyn and... Thank you, Maurice. Can everyone hear? Okay, perfect. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, today we're going to be looking at a bit about uh, drug use, drug abuse, and how we utilize those aspects of, of, of drugs within some of our medico-legal forensic type cases. Sorry. While we wait, has anyone heard of forensic toxicology before? Okay. Was it good? Oh, wait, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to use a keyboard while we wait. All right, so today what we're going to really just, just look at is well, what is the actual definition of a drug? And what are drugs that are commonly abused, not only in our community, but in, in globally in the world? And why it is exactly that people use drugs, and particularly why they abuse drugs, um, and why they become addicted. Um, and then we'll look a bit more into toxicology, so how drugs and chemicals relate to um, toxicology workflows and, and the medical legal environment. So, and then obviously we'll hone in on, on forensic toxicology because there are many branches of toxicology. And we'll look at some of the applications that we utilize in forensic toxicology, why we use uh, forensic toxicology both here as well as globally. Um, and I'll touch on at the end just some of the, the suggested education and training requirements for forensic toxicologists as well as where they can work in South Africa. So what is a drug? Now I ask this to my medical students quite a lot and they uh, oftentimes don't know. Uh, many people think of drug as being a narcotic, being an illicit substance. But a drug is really any chemical substance. It's a chemical substance that when we ingest or administer, it basically changes our body. It changes how our body works, it changes how our mind works. Drugs of abuse, on the hand, are substances that people like to use because we get a nice feeling. 
we feel rewarded, we feel high or euphoric. So drugs in general can be illicit, heroin, marijuana, methamphetamine. They can be legal for adults, alcohol, tobacco, uh, and cigarettes. And they can also be prescription or medication or over-the-counter type drugs. Anything that we take that basically alters our physiology or our body, our biology, is a drug. So believe it or not, Psychoactive drugs, which are drugs that alter our psyche, alter our brain functioning, are uh, prevalent within our society every day, right? I'll have a double espresso. Caffeine. Caffeine is the active ingredient in coffee that basically makes us feel stimulated. We like it. Could I borrow a light? So we've spoken about tobacco and cigarettes. Nicotine is the active ingredient there. What about a brandy and coke? Well, alcohol, one of the most, or it is the most abused drug in the world. Probably the most, uh, the drug that causes the most uh, injuries and fatalities in the world as well. Yet it's the legal drug, right? Coca-Cola, nowadays many people would say Coca-Cola or sugar, as we say, is the new drug, right? Um, many people die from obesity and all those natural health problems that's largely due to all the sugar and carbohydrates that are, are in our, our food and everything that we eat. What about some chocolate? I need some chocolate when I'm down. Theobromine is the active ingredient in chocolate that makes us feel better. It affects our reward pathway in the brain. So here we've looked at some psychoactive drugs. They affect our brain that we commonly use every day. So when we're dry, we say, you know, are you a drug user? Well, if you drink coffee every morning, you actually are using drugs. So these are illicit, they're legal. What about illicit drugs? Well, I've put a photo up here. This is a methamphetamine pipe. In South Africa, we call it a tick lolly. Tick is the South African slang name for methamphetamine. And we call it that because it makes this tick, 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 tick sound when it's being smoked. So perhaps they're borrowing a light for smoking some methamphetamine. Instead of brandy and coke, what about brandy and some cocaine? Cocaine actually comes in two forms. It comes in crack cocaine, which is this upper photo here, it's little rocks, and cocaine hydrochloride, which is the powder that people snort. You actually can't smoke powder cocaine, it doesn't actually burn. So you can smoke uh, crack cocaine, um, and it's a, just a small different chemical change in the structure that actually alters how you take in that particular drug. So that's illicit. And what about some marijuana brownies, right? I need some chocolate uh, with some marijuana. So we'll look at this a bit later, but delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol is the active ingredient in cannabis that affects the psychoactive parts of our brain. So there's obviously a lot of debate about this nowadays because it's slowly becoming legal all around the world. It's not a harmless drug. Um, people, many people think it's, not, it's a harmless drug, but it's not. It does increase your risk of accidents if you're driving under the influence. Um, it does have various uh, health issues, which we'll look at a bit later. So why do people use drugs? Whether licit or illicit. Well, we want to feel good, right? And this is typically why people start abusing drugs. They affect the reward pathways of our brain. They make us feel good. We want to stop feeling bad. People who have depression or various other mental health illnesses want to get out of what is reality. And drugs allow them to do that by altering our psyche. We want to do well in school at work. Cocaine, methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin. Um, a lot of your, uh, or it's also in, in America, it's known as Adderall. Those are all stimulants. People like to use those to keep them going through the day, particularly nowadays where schedules are very tough, long hours. You've got to do work, a lot of work to stay ahead. People like using those type of drugs. So Ritalin is actually a highly abused drug. Okay, so why do people use drugs? These are, these are some of the factors, right? Why do people then start abusing them? So drugs of abuse 
start exciting parts of the brain that make us feel good. Caffeine makes us feel good in the morning, wakes us up, we like it. So you start taking it again. And your brain actually gets used to taking that drug. But what happens is the body develops what is known as a tolerance to the drug. So the body becomes used to it. And because of that, it actually in itself starts requiring that you take more drug to get the same initial good effect. So it gets to a point, really, where your brain and your body has to have that drug just to stay on baseline. And if you don't have the drug, you start feeling sick. And this is basically known as addiction, right? Where we have a strong urge to take a drug, even though it's affecting us negatively. So for example, if we go back to caffeine, this is, this is we, we're dealing with a, a legal drug here. Caffeine, if you continuously take it, drink a couple, coffees, a couple cups of coffee a day, if you stop drinking it, you're actually going to go through what is known as withdrawal, which is this process of feeling bad effects because you don't have the drug. Tired, you have headaches. That's the process of going through caffeine withdrawal. Obviously, when you deal with drugs that have a higher addictive property or higher addictive liability, like heroin or alcohol even, um, if you are an addict addicted to heroin or alcohol, if you withdraw from that, if you stop taking that drug, the withdrawal effects are so bad that it can lead to death. That is why we need treatment centers. You can't just go off a drug. Okay, so that's what addiction really is. Okay, so we say, well, wh wh why don't you just quit? Quit smoking, quit drinking. Now, for some people, that is possible. Not everyone gets addicted to all different kinds of drugs. There's our environment and there's our genetics. So some people are more genetically prone to being addicted to certain drugs. But at the end of the day, anyone can be addicted. All of us sitting here can be addicted to any kind of drug. They don't discriminate according to our income. You know, back in the day, um, okay, let's not go into that. Uh, income according to our job. You find very high profile people using certain kinds of drugs, other people using other kinds of drugs. It doesn't matter what kind of job you do. Our age. Today, nowadays, younger and younger and younger people are experimenting with drugs. Things like cannabis particularly. And it doesn't discriminate according to our race. If you are this particular race, you are not more prone to becoming addicted. And the problem with drug addiction is that it has far-reaching consequences into our family life, into our jobs, we can lose our jobs, into your health. Um, so the consequences are far and wide. But what I want to hone in on here is really it is a disease of the brain. Drug addiction, uh, we, we get a lot of information fed to us about the war on drugs. Drug addiction is a disease. It's a disease of the brain. It's a chronic, so it continues for a long time, relapsing, so if you stop, you often go back because the drive for using that drug is so high. And it's a compulsive disorder. So it is a disorder of the brain. And I've got a few videos, I think two or three videos as we go along, very short, um, just to keep us awake. So, um, so we're going to say, why are drugs so hard to quit? And this is a good, this is some general information. This is about general life. You know, we often say to our friends and our family, well, just stop taking that drug. It's actually not that easy, uh, particularly if a person is addicted. So let's see if this Ever works. hear someone with a drug problem talk about quitting? And then they try to quit on their own with no help. They tell their friends they've given up drugs forever. It usually doesn't work. Eventually, they slip and start using again. Why are drugs so hard to quit? Because addiction is a brain disease. Addiction is when you feel a strong urge to keep taking a drug, even if it is causing harm. To stop, ask for help. 
Your brain is like a control tower. It sends out signals that direct your actions and choices. When you take drugs, the chemical signals in your brain change. This affects your choices, your actions, and even the way you feel. The part of your brain that lets you feel pleasure can be changed by drugs. Normally, this pleasure center is active when you eat, fall in love, or experience something else you enjoy. After a while, the drug becomes more important. When someone takes a drug, they first feel a rush or a high. But over time, the high is not as strong, and they need the drug to keep from feeling bad. This is what happens when you are addicted. But you don't have to stay that way. Quitting drugs is hard, but it can be done. If you or someone you love has a problem, get help. Find drug treatment near you. Okay, so we can see that it is, in fact, a disease of the brain. Okay. So why is this? Why do we like taking drugs and why does it affect us so much? Well, our brain is a very uh, beautiful and intricate organ. It's made up of millions and millions of tiny cells known as neurons. And these neurons actually send chemical and electrical signals to each other. And that's really what actually controls the functioning of our entire body. So if I refer to the central nervous system, I'm really referring to the brain and the spinal cord. It's really everything that controls our nerves um, and basically our, the body's functioning. Um, so I had a slide here, and, and I'm not, this, is, this gets a little bit more complicated, but um, what this particular video is showing us is the reward circuit of the brain and how methamphetamine, as an example, affects the reward circuit of the brain. So what does it actually do when we actually look inside the brain? Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about methamphetamine a bit later, but methamphetamine is a stimulant drug. It basically stimulates our central nervous system. You get very excited, heart rate goes up, but it also leads to things like aggression and violence, as well as strokes and heart attacks. Now, methamphetamine is one of the most widely abused drugs in, Cape, in Western Cape, in particular, if we look at the rest of South Africa. We have the highest um, abuse of methamphetamine in this particular province. So we'll just watch a bit of this. And this is a fantastic... Deep the, within the brain okay. is a set of structures called the limbic system. The limbic system contains the brain's reward circuit, or pathway. The reward circuit links together a number of brain structures that control and regulate our ability to feel pleasure. Feeling pleasure motivates us to repeat behaviors. When the reward circuit is activated, each individual cell in the circuit relays electrical and chemical signals. The small gap between the sending and receiving cells is called the synapse. In the reward circuit, dopamine neurons release the neurotransmitter, dopamine. The released dopamine molecules travel across the synapse and link up with proteins called dopamine receptors on the surface of the receiving cell. When dopamine binds to the exterior of the dopamine receptor, this causes proteins attached to the interior part of the receptors to carry the signal onward within the cell. Some dopamine molecules re-enter the sending cell via dopamine transporters and can be re-released. When a reward is encountered, the presynaptic cell releases a larger amount of dopamine in a sudden burst. Dopamine transporters will then quickly remove the excess. Dopamine surges in response to natural rewards help the brain learn and adapt to a complex world. However, drugs are able to hijack this process, contributing to unhealthy behaviors and consequences. When someone first uses methamphetamine, the drug quickly enters the brain. At low doses, meth blocks the re-entry of dopamine into the presynaptic cell, just like cocaine does. But unlike cocaine, higher doses of meth can increase the release of dopamine from the cell, leading to much, much more dopamine in the synapse. 
where it becomes trapped since meth prevents the transporters from removing it. Because so much dopamine remains in the synapse for such long periods of time, the postsynaptic cell is activated to dangerously high levels, causing the user to experience powerful feelings of euphoria, making meth incredibly addictive. Okay, so that, that shows us on a, on a cellular level what is actually happening when we take drugs. And the whole, really the, the premise behind it is that drugs basically alter our messaging system in the brain. They alter those release of chemicals and the movement of signals through the brain and therefore to our body. So dopamine, what they spoke about, is a neurotransmitter. It's naturally produced in our body. It's like serotonin. These are what we call the happy endorphins, right? When you go running, these are produced. You feel good. It affects your reward pathway. So what happens, as we saw, is that drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, they basically aid in pushing out those um, dopamine and other uh, chemicals to basically bind to postsynaptic neurons and keep those messages of reward going. So that's why people feel euphoria. They feel good because those reward pathways are being pushed to high, high extents. So when we look at drugs of abuse, um, there's many different kinds of drugs that can be abused. But drugs that are mostly abused are ones that have kind of this high liability or high ability to make us feel good initially, right? At least initially. Alcohol, as we've spoken about. The ingredient in alcohol is ethanol. That's, that's really the active ingredient present in all your different types of alcohols, beer, wine, etc. Most widely abused drug globally causes the most harm globally, legal globally. Various other drugs that we'll touch on a bit later, things like marijuana. So this is cannabis. People smoke marijuana usually, but now you, nowadays you have people making cannabis oils and various other uh, more stronger uh, forms of the psychoactive ingredients in cannabis. MDMA is the big club drug, ecstasy. Everyone talks about it. ecstasy, methylene, uh, methylene dimethoxyamphetamine uh, is basically what it stands for. And nowadays, unfortunately, when people go to the clubs and they buy what they think is ecstasy, you can actually be buying certain designer drugs. And designer drugs are things that are known as bar salts, spice, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic opioids. So these are synthetic drugs, meaning they're made in labs, and they're largely made by clandestine drug dealers or drug chemists. Um, and they're based upon the structures, the chemical structures are based upon drugs that are naturally made. Synthetic cannabinoids, for example, are based upon the cannabis, the drugs in cannabis. However, these drugs that people produce in these labs are far more potent. So we're getting a lot of these bar salts, which are known as synthetic cathinones, uh, being produced, which are largely based upon the cat plant. I don't know if you've ever heard of cat, K-H-A-T. Many people talk about I'm using, chewing the cat plant. The actual drug in there that causes the stimulation is cathinone. And so what drug dealers did is they started producing different cathinones. Now what happens is these bind to the same areas in the brain, but they're far more potent. So these drugs are causing a lot of deaths worldwide. You can't die from smoking too much marijuana. You usually get sick before you actually die. You can easily die from smoking synthetic cannabinoids, or synthetic marijuana as people call it. So nowadays people are selling various types of synthetic drugs at parties and raves and things like that, which are actually not what the user thinks they are produce same kind of effects, but you're not actually producing the exact drug that you thought you were producing. So it's become quite a problem. The other problem that we face, and we'll see as forensic toxicologists, is 
keeping up with this market of constantly changing drugs. It is very difficult for us analytically, which we'll see later, to detect and figure out what these drugs are. Okay, we spoke a bit about cocaine, and I'll go into a bit of detail later. Cocaine powder and crack cocaine. Heroin is an opioid. Um, causes uh, sedation and pain relief. One of the most widely abused opioids. And we'll discuss later about the new opioid epidemic in the States and internationally, if you've heard about it. Um, the drug-related deaths are, have become the most or the highest cause of death in the States. Higher than natural, higher than car crashes, and that's because of the opioid epidemic in the United States at the moment. Why is that? Because there are far more potent opioids like fentanyl and synthetic fentanyls that people are using because they think they're using heroin and they're dying like that. So there's a huge epidemic that they actually can't control at the moment in the States. Pain medication can easily be abused, again, particularly your opioids. Things like oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphin, um, all those opioids that are sedative analgesics that you get for pain relief, tramadol, all of those are highly, highly addictive drugs. And back in the United States, if we go back to them, um, pain medication overdoses were initially what was causing the deaths. And then people didn't get high enough on those and they put a bit more legislation on pain medication. And so they started going back to heroin. And then we get various other kind of drugs. So that's just an example of, of some of the drugs that people abuse. Um, and these are a few out of many, many different kinds of drugs that people can abuse. Largely, it's what's available, what's cheapest, and um, what gives you the best high. So in terms of the, glo the, the burden of drug abuse and, and uh, use and abuse, and we, we're dealing here more so with drugs that people abuse, right? So we, we spoke a bit about drug use and that any substance you use can change your, your body. What we're looking at for the rest of the presentation is drugs of abuse, so things that we just looked at in the previous slide. So alcohol, as I mentioned, is one of the major drugs of abuse, and it causes millions of deaths a year. Now, this can either be as a contributory factor, so for example, a car crash, where a person is under the influence of alcohol, or it can be directly causative, and that can be both acute or chronic. So acute, you can drink enough alcohol and die. It's alcohol, acute alcohol overdose. Amy Winehouse died of an acute alcohol overdose. Um, a chronic use of alcohol can lead to a lot of damages within the body. So you might die a natural death because of liver cirrhosis, particularly, or other natural problems that basically derive from your chronic use of drinking alcohol. So alcohol is very, very bad drug, but other drugs as well cause these drug use disorders and addictions. So there's millions of people out there who live with addiction. And the problem is, is we don't see addiction currently as a brain disease. We see it as a war on drugs. You took the drugs, we must therefore have put you out of our society instead of treating it as if it is a mental disorder. Um, so not only having these drug disorders, there's various other health problems that come along with using drugs, particularly if people inject hepatitis C, HIV, um, it's very easy to, to catch any of those viruses, particularly if people are sharing needles. I heard a couple months ago, you can buy a needle on the street here, yeah, or you can borrow someone's needle for five rand. So you can see that that's just, that's just a, a, a nightmare waiting to happen. Many people, and, and drug users are very, they're actually, they're intelligent about their drug use. They know what the harms might do to their body, at least initially. So people have tended to more go for trying to smoke drugs rather than inject drugs, um, as long as they get the same high. Once people get addicted, it really, your body becomes just a, a, a means of getting the drug in. And we'll see some, some uh, parts of the body later that have been affected by 
like injecting drugs, for example. Millions of people, um, fairly young to fairly old, have at least used one drug in 2014. So these kind of uh, studies are not always um, completely comprehensive. And particularly in South Africa, there's not a lot of data that gets put out in terms of what is our drug use in our population, um, what are we seeing. But what we're really seeing is that younger and younger people are starting to use drugs of abuse. And I mentioned USA before. Their highest death cause at the moment is because of drugs. And that's massive. Um, and that's because of the opioid ep epidemic. If you're interested, go read about the opioid epidemic. So what about in South Africa? Well, apparently we've lost millions of dollars uh, in this was a, a, a published in 2009 as a result of alcohol abuse. And there's multiple factors behind losing that money. Okay? So there's huge uh, kind of means for the government is pushing forward a lot of game changer programs, alcohol game changer, to try and prevent alcohol related injuries. Yes, and while alcohol is very important for us to focus on, and we need to focus on reducing that. We cannot forget about drug use, other drugs and how they also affect not only our econ economy but our communities. So um, the SACINDU is really one of the kind of only groups that uh, put out epidemiological um, research and numbers about treatment patients. So these are only from, you must always think about where is the research coming from. These are only from treatment centers. So it means it's going to only be the people who have access to treatment centers and who want to go to treatment centers. So they, they've produced a lot of good data. If you go read about SAC and do, um, you can go read about some of the treatment data. But you'll find that a lot of people who go into treatment um, across South Africa are largely because of the drugs that I've mentioned here. And we've mentioned some of them, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail about them. The problem is that South Africa, we don't have a representative survey of substance abuse. We don't have data that's consistently coming out. Um, and until this kind of information is, uh, you know, it's possible that we can get all this data out, particularly such as in my lab, we can get a lot of data out about post-mortem cases, what is causing the death of our people in the communities without funding, without support. It's very difficult to actually to do that. So we spoke a bit about alcohol. Alcohol, biggest drug, widely used. Initially at very low concentrations, when you have a couple of beers or a glass of wine, you start um, maybe having reduced inhibitions. You speak a lot. Maybe you'll dance a bit easier, you feel a bit better. Many people actually think that alcohol is stimulating you, but it's not. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant drug. So what it actually does is it depresses the inhibitory centers of the brain, so you feel stimulated. So that's what it does at very low kind of concentrations in your body. When you start drinking more and more and more, then you start slurring your speech. Your motor becomes impaired, you can't walk straight, you can't see straight, your vision becomes impaired, even your hearing, taste becomes impaired. Um, and then as you increase your drinking, you can't concentrate, you're confused, and eventually you start being so depressed, because now it's depressing all the parts of your brain, that you fall unconscious, or into a coma, or die if you drink enough alcohol. So alcohol is probably the most widely studied drug, so we know a lot about it and how it affects the body. Cannabis I mentioned before, this comes from a plant. Most of the drugs we abuse nowadays are based on natural plants, come from natural plants. Um, Short-term effects of cannabis are obviously this euphoria, feeling good, right? Brings about some drowsiness, relaxation, what also comes about is you start, your reaction time starts slowing down, okay? But the thing with cannabis is that your learning and your memory starts to become affected. So even at small doses of cannabis, remembering things becomes very difficult. 
as soon as you start using more and more cannabis, you can get things like hallucinations, panic attacks, paranoia, even psychosis. And this is, there's been a lot of studies that now focus on these aspects of cannabis use. Because it's not a, it's not, no drug is perfect. So when people come out and push cannabis use, there are negative aspects. Uh, there are the side effects and toxic effects to using cannabis as well. Um, long term cannabis use, chronic cannabis use is not, uh, it's not, doesn't produce nothing. You can get a lot of mental health issues. People have PTSD or flashbacks, psychosis. Um, so it really does affect the brain quite significantly. Um, people want to use these drugs because they like it, and um, why should it be illegal if alcohol is legal? So if, and, and I mean there are places in America where it is legal, and obviously the Netherlands, Netherlands and places like that, but there are studies out there that show that cannabis does have some good effects. So for example, it's used for cancer treatment. Uh, helps in eating, it's used for pain relief in some people where pain relief and other medication doesn't work. So it has its benefits to it. Um, the problem is that regulating cannabis is going to be extremely difficult. Every bag of cannabis you buy has a different percentage of THC, the psychoactive compound. So that's going to be so highly regulated, very much like you buy alcohol. It's going to have to say on the wine bottle, 14%. So people want to use it because it is, they, they like using this drug very much like we having a, like having a glass of wine. Um, and I think that's more a political debate and sometimes the science actually gets left behind, unfortunately. Great question. So there are issues to it and they mustn't be overlooked. Methamphetamine, as we said, is the most widely abused drug in Cape Town and in South Africa. This is a huge, huge epidemic that we're facing. And the problem with methamphetamine is it causes this kind of increased stimulation of the body. Uh, your temperature rises, you, you feel uh, almost invincible. So it causes people to do a lot of things that they may norm normally not have done, right? Um, but the problem is if you long term, if you use a drug long term, confusion, paranoia, you can't sleep, mood problems. And then you start seeing things like violent behavior. And this is why um, I, I have evidence from the case, some of the cases and research that we've been doing in our homicide fatalities. We are seeing a lot of methamphetamine in the victims. And I can guarantee you that this drug is contributing to some of our homicide rates. So not only that, but there's obviously various health problems that come, come with methamphetamine. And this is typically when methamphetamine is crystal methamphetamine. If you watch Breaking Bad, it's not blue. Um, I'm sure they can dye it to make it blue, but um, it's usually, usually white crystals. Now interestingly, methaquilone. Methaquilone is a drug also known as Mandrax, that's only abused in South Africa. Not abused anywhere else. I go to conferences overseas, methaquilone, those are old drugs. These used to be known as quaaludes. Um, today we also know, we, we call it Mandrax. And methaquilone is basically a sedative hypnotic, so it causes sedation and it causes kind of like dissociative effects. So it causes this deep rate relaxation in the individual. But it also can, if people use too much, cause delirium, psychosis. Um, and then eventually, if, if you use too much, you fall into coma and possibly die. Now, this is known as a vit pipe, a uh, white pipe. And this is typically how, how it's smoked in, in South Africa, in the head of a bottle, the bottleneck. The Mandrax tablets are put in there, or crushed up. And it's often um, mixed with marijuana, and then it's smoked through the, the, the um, neck of the bottle. So I'll show you uh, a bit later from a post-mortem case what you can look for to try and see some of the signs of these kind of, um, this drug use. But this is a very interesting drug, because it's not actually abused elsewhere. 
And what most people, or what we find in the lab is that methaquilone is commonly used with methamphetamine. So we think that it is um, there to possibly help with, sedate them when they come down from the high of methamphetamine. So they feel good at when they hit the high of meth, but every high has to lead to a low. So the sedation, is, we think, is supposed to help them through the process of getting through that. Heroin is another one. This is, as, as I've said, an opioid drug. So it comes from the opium poppy, natural drug, right? Morphine, if you cut open an opium poppy, there's a white substance that comes out. In that substance is morphine, codeine, and thebane. Just in that substance, you have natural morphine. From morphine, we actually synthesize heroin. Heroin is just diacetylmorphine. It's got another different acetyl group on it. So heroin is used in multiple different ways nowadays. Because it's so strong and so potent nowadays, um, a lot of people smoke it. It's known as chasing the dragon. It's basically pour, uh, the powder is put onto some tin foil, and they burn it and smoke the, the fumes that basically come up. And it produces a very similar high to injecting it straight into the blood. Remember that the purpose of taking these drugs is to get it as quickly as possible to the brain. So the quickest way is to inject it into the blood, go straight to the brain. When we take something orally, it has to get through our stomach, all the acids, all the um, cells to be absorbed into the bloodstream that surrounds the stomach. So that's why things take a little bit of time to start working if we take them orally. Smoking has a very similar pattern to injecting. There's a lot of blood vessels at the bottom of your lungs. So it actually gets very quick. Uh, drugs usually get, very, um, get taken up into the bloodstream very rapidly when smoked. Heroin, we know, is hugely associated with addiction. And this addiction leads to the use of the drug even though it affects your body negatively. So you see veins that are collapsed from injecting too much. Um, and then there's various other issues. But one of the largest ones is acute overdose of heroin. Because you develop such a tolerance. Remember, remember I spoke about how your body becomes used to a drug? So typically, I see, we see in cases, if I, if I see a suspected opioid overdose and I look at the scene, and this is paraphernalia that you typically find in the scene, your needles, your little baggies of heroin, and a spoon. It's basically put on the spoon, um, heated up with some water, and then pulled into the needle and injected. So if we, if we see this, um, one of the first questions I'll ask is, was this individual in rehab? or in jail. And typically two to three weeks after, if someone is, a, is a, an addicted user and goes to rehab or jail and gets off the drug, you'll find that two to three weeks after, sometimes they, they relapse, but they use the same dose that they used before. And their body is no longer as tolerant, so it causes an overdose. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, he was a heroin overdose. And I think he was in and out of treatment. Um, but I think some fentanyl was also in his heroin baggie. Okay. So other substances of interest in forensic, particularly in South Africa, um, hallucinogens, over-the-counter drugs. There's a huge problem with buying cough syrups that have sedatives like dextromethorphan or codeine in them. You'll find that uh, kids and young adolescents like to pour this cough syrup into bottles drink it with Sprite, and it sedates them for the day. In our post-mortem cases, pretty much anything that can kill you becomes of interest to us. Corrosives, battery acid, antifreeze for the cars, chemicals, disinfectants, bleach, all of those kind of things we see in our cases. In South Africa, herbal traditional medicines are important. Um, natural toxins as well as environmental toxins, smoke in the air, pollutants, um, and pesticides is a big one, big problem that we face. In our informal settlements, most people commit suicide more on using pesticides than using other medication. It's what they have available to them. Okay, so that took a bit longer than I would like, but anyway, let's go on. What is toxicology? So as toxicologists, we really look at studying the harmful effects 
of these chemicals and drugs and how, how this affects our living system. Okay. So you keep that in mind, it's looking at harmful or adverse effects. And Paracelsus, he was a um, physician back in the day, and he came up with this blurb saying the dose makes the poison. So if you take something, it's the amount that you take that makes it toxic. So that was his little quirk there. And ironically, as I mentioned before, there's no perfect drug. We spoke about heroin and its negative effects. Well, back in the day, heroin was just over the counter and prescri prescribed largely for relieving cough. It was an antitussive. It was a cough reliever. And then people started realizing that people were becoming addicted to it. They took it off the market. So they have their pros and their cons. So Paracelsus said, it's the dose. How much you take, if I take too much of, of, of this particular uh, coffee, it's going to eventually cause me to die if I take too much of it. What we've realized over the years is that it is a far more intricate system. It's not just how much you take, right? And it depends on a various number of things that I've put up here, a few of which are up here. But it really comes down to these two uh, terms here, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. When I take a drug, how is it absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and eventually excreted? What the body does to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. How does it make me feel? What is it, are its effects? So this is affected by all these aspects here. So males and females, we metabolize drugs differently. We're often affected more by alcohol if we drink the same amount of alcohol. Um, and that's largely, there's metab metabolic factors, there's various other factors in there. Organ function, if you have kidney and liver problems, you can't metabolize or break down and excrete drugs as normal or as you should, so it can build up. Genetics, as I mentioned before. Just age. We speak about a lot about younger children. That's why you give doses, smaller doses to children than you do teenager because their system is not fully in place. It's not fully um, developed. So they can't go through the same process of breaking down and excreting drugs the same way that adults do. So there's various other things. Diseases, co-medication. Here's the reference if you want to read more about it. But all these factors, not just dose, affect how our, drug, how our body responds to a drug. And that's why I respond differently to a drug than every single one of you. And this is where personalized medicine has come, come into play nowadays. Actually tailoring um, prescription and medication for people based on all of these factors. So what is forensic toxicology? So we deal with medical legal aspects of toxicology. As a forensic toxicologist, we have to ask, answer this question did any drugs, substances, alcohol, chemicals like pesticides cause or contribute to someone's death or lead them to be intoxicated? For example, in cases of DUI, driving under the influence. Were they intoxicated when they were driving? So that's what we have to answer. And we work with a, a, a various number of, of people to try and answer this question. So we have many applications as forensic toxicologists. I just spoke about post-mortem tox. We have to see, did a drug or substance cause or contribute to death? Drug-facilitated crimes. These are crimes in which drugs were present, the person is intoxicated, and a crime is committed. Driving under the influence. Drug-facilitated sexual assault. Forensic drug testing is another area. Empl work employment testing, you can't be under the influence at work, so sometimes work employment testing, urine, dipstick type test is done. Doping in humans and in animals, forensic toxicologists work there as well, and there's various other areas, wildlife, looking at whether animals have been poisoned, drug abstinence monitoring, custody of children, and testing the adults or the parents. 
always we have a strong emphasis on chain of custody, records, quality control and assurance. We're part of forensics, it's a legal matter, so we will have to stand up and testify to what we have done if need be. So as a toxicologist, these are the major functions that we, um, we perform within all of those applications that I just discussed. We receive some kind of specimen. And we have to then analyze that in the lab. We have to get results and interpret them. And then we have to report it out to our stakeholders uh, or report it out in the form of testimony in the, in the court of law. And at the same time, we must, we must never forget the importance of our work to public health, to um, research and epidemiology and understanding what is uh, affecting and killing our community. So if we look at specimens, we can collect multiple different kinds of specimens. Usually blood, serum and plasma are some of the main ones. And so what I've put in here is just the hours that you'll usually find the drug. If you take one dose of a drug, you usually find it in blood for about one to 48 hours. Um, so we look for parent drugs, which is the main drug. Metabolites are the breakdowns of the drugs. Blood is the most important specimen for interpreting the extent of impairment. Nowadays, people take oral fluid or saliva. This is a big thing in Australia. And they're driving under the influence. They take saliva swabs instead of breathalyzers at the, or breathalyzers and saliva swabs um, for drugs at roadside testing. Urine, this usually tells us only that someone has used a drug. So you can see, you see it for a much, you'll see the drug and its breakdown product for a much longer time in urine, but you can't interpret any sort of impairment from a urine result. And hair is a big thing nowadays. Hair is a big alternative specimen. Very good for looking at someone's chronic use of drugs. Hair is often used in custody type cases. Has the parent used drugs when they weren't supposed to? Well, you can segment and look at the hair and try to put together a time frame uh, of drug use. And there's many, many specimens that are being used, alternative specimens, um, to look at and investigate drugs in the individuals. So as a toxicologist, you really just have to think about what can I interpret out of this result? And that's why blood is very important. I can interpret a lot more about the state of intoxication of an individual. So example post-mortem cases. This is from post-mortem cases from DC. Um, we collect blood and urine. Over here we have some brain. Vitreous humor from the eye. Okay, well let's just go up here, blood. Urine, vitreous humor comes from the eye. Bile comes from the gallbladder. Again, it's a very good specimen to tell, did someone use drugs? Can't tell much more than that. The liver, the brain is a great specimen, particularly for drugs that like going to the brain and sticking there. The brain is lipophilic, it's lipids, it's made up of fat type tissue. So drugs that are, um, have more fat type molecules can be stored for longer periods of time in the brain. Gastric contents is great. You might smell something, you might see something. You know, well, our pesticide cases, this is the best specimen. We find black granules or something in the, in the stomach content. And once you analyze it and find the pesticide, um, we, we know it's that. Whereas pesticides break down so easily in the other specimens, we don't find it. Even blood clots in the brain, if someone falls, um, as soon as you, if you hit your head and a, a blood clot actually starts forming, um, what happens is the blood stops moving in that particular area. So we can, even if the individual dies a few days later, when alcohol is no longer in their system, you can actually still find alcohol and drugs in that blood clot because it stopped, the blood stopped flowing. And various other alternative specimens like bone marrow and um, bugs and various other things have now come into play. But these are the largely the, the most important specimens in post-mortem talks. Question? Oh, 
oh, you're saying someone else's blood? We don't, we don't look at blood typing. Um, so that wouldn't be part of our routine type casework, yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna go too much into the analytical process, but really, as I said, we receive specimens. It has to undergo some kind of preparation um, so we can put it into our instruments. So we undergo two major steps in the tox lab. And this is not like CSI, it doesn't take five minutes. This takes a very, very long time. Um, and not only that, to make sure the quality is in place, to make uh, sure that the, the results we actually give you are valid, takes a long time as well. So in most cases, internationally now speaking, um, a good turnaround time for an average case is about 60 to 90 days. If you start dealing with designer drugs, far more complex. You find something you don't know what it is, you're gonna be uh, waiting a long, longer time. Now that's because we have to make sure the drug is there, and we also, as, is something there, and we have to confirm that the drug is there, and how much is there, quantitate it. And these are difficult analytical chemistry techniques. Um, they're, not, they're not as simple. Now, some cases can get turnaround time very quickly. It's not that the analysis often takes long, but sometimes you have to do certain screens on one week, and then if you find something, confirm something in the next week. Um, so it really is about making sure, under, having an understanding that the lab, um, to make sure that, the, that we produce quality data and quality results to the stakeholders, it doesn't take, um, it's not CSI. <laughs> Um, so, in terms of sample prep, we receive the sample. We go through some chemical techniques in the lab uh, to extract the drug, to get the drug out of that ugly specimen. So we can get it in nice little vials to go into our instruments. Now that extraction process, you have different extractions for different drugs, for different assays or methods that you're running. Um, can take an hour to five hours depending on what you have to do, dry down things, add these things, heat these things. So it's a very complicated process. Now I'm not gonna go into this, but these are some of the instruments that we use in screening. Is a drug there? Now this instrument here is, uh, I wanna get this one, um, nine million rand, great instrument. So we have, we have international, the equipment is, is uh, utilized not only here but internationally. We all, we all use the same techniques and equipment. The challenge comes in in making sure that the education and the standards and all of those things is maintained. So we might produce, so following these analyses on these fantastic instruments, we might produce a lab report such as this. It tells us what drugs are found, ethanol, etc what the amounts are, and what specimen was used. So this would cardiac or heart blood. Um, so from these types of results, we would then be able to interpret and say, okay, what does, so these are all synthetic cannabinoids, um, what does 3.4 nanograms per mil delta-9 THC, which is marijuana, is a psychoactive compound, what does it mean if I find that in cardiac blood? And that's really where your toxicological expertise has to come in play. And this is what we need to take into account when we interpret these results, okay? We need to think about all these aspects just in the one case. Each case should really be interpreted um, according to that particular case. So according to the circumstances, what happened before, what happened after the accident or the death of the individual. Um, how much do they usually use? What kind of medications do they use? What kind of drugs do they usually take? Is someone tolerant to these drugs? Are we seeing higher concentrations, those numbers that I showed you, just because they are more tolerant, but it actually didn't even cause their death or cause the accident? Um, and then when we get to kind of deceased individuals, this is where we start having to think about when a person dies, what happens to drugs in the body? How does it change? And that's one of the challenges that we face as postmortem toxicologists, is that drugs don't stay the same when you die. They break down, they move around the body, they do a lot of things that we then have to figure out what those results actually mean in the context of the case. And that's why we saw postmortem.